Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. Um, and as part of my ongoing Booker nonsense slash project to read all of the shortlists of the Booker Prize over the years, um, I'm now on another one from a good 25 years ago, and that is the 1999 Booker shortlist. And it's been really fun going back and revisiting these. I realise maybe more fun for me than anybody else, but who knows. Um, but anyway, let's talk a little bit about the shortlist. I'm going to start with the winner and then go through alphabetically for the, the rest of the books in that shortlist. But I'd love to hear your thoughts as well, and uh, let's get started. So these were the days before sh uh, the, the long lists were also added to it. So it was only shortlists at this stage, but we are given these six books, and the winner from this year was J.M. Kurtzia with Disgrace. Um, and I recently did the 2009 video, and you'll have seen that he almost won a third time in that, uh, that year. And in 1999 was when he got his second win with Disgrace. Um, I think it's worth saying from the jump that there is some kind of law around this that actually two of the judges in the uh, from the panel and particularly actually the two women in the panel chose a different winner which we'll talk about next and they were upset that Disgrace won and I can see that. I still think for, for me Disgrace is up there with some of the best winners that I think the Booker Prize has ever had but this is a tough go as a read. Disgrace is mostly focused on two parallel stories that happen, um, both of which involve the same man. Um, so we meet this man right at the beginning of the book, and he is uh, going out, well, going out is putting it too diplomatically. He has some kind of transactional relationship that involves sex with a younger woman. He is a professor or some kind of um, academic person at a university and it's presented to us right from the beginning that there is essentially this power imbalance. He is not only um, an older man in a position of power and she's a, um, in a more vulnerable state but there's also a racial and gender line that is happening here with him being a white man um, in South Africa her being a woman of colour and with this age difference and this power and difference there's something set up there. This man we're also presented from the jump as being quite oblivious to a lot of things happening. We as the reader I think are meant to read between the lines quite strongly that he is not a nice man in any way but also is fairly oblivious to those dynamics that I just mentioned and what comes up from this is something even more grim as this book continues. So there is a situation in which uh, his homestead or farm or, or whatever it is, is attacked. Um, and this is a place where his daughter is. His daughter is then attacked and um, we, I think, are led to believe quite early on in the text that she has been sexually assaulted in some capacity. He's, he really struggles with understanding this. Um, and he is unable to put these things together. And particularly there's an inversion of some of those same power differentials in this because she, a wealthy white woman in South Africa, has been attacked by poorer black men. And so the power differentials are a little bit different, well, almost inverse to the ones that had happened for her father. But her father is unable to place these things and instead goes on almost this war path of trying to work out how to seek vengeance all all the while ignoring the pleas from his daughter and I think what really sets this book up at the heart of it and makes it so powerful but also so difficult to read is James Kurtzia sort of hangs around in that really awkward and uncomfortable part of this book the deeply difficult conversations around um, these power imbalances, around sexual assault, around so many other things. But he is also such an oblivious character, this central, this central figure. And so we're, we're drawn in to see how he will do, you know, he will seek revenge on these men who have assaulted his daughter, but he will also not listen to her when she tries to downplay it or doesn't want something else to happen. But he will also, again, not see that as being at all problematic with any of his behaviour. It's a deeply uncomfortable book. Um, there were 
a lot of conversations at the time where also when it when it won where various uh, leaders particularly in South Africa but also some other African leaders spoke out about the you know saying is this the only media representation that we have of Africa that it's violence and assault and whatever and curtsy a sort of reply well being like well actually you know I'm just I'm representing a story. There are many things within this. No one story needs to be able to, should be, sort of have that responsibility to do this. I think it's a deeply unsettling and difficult novel, but an incredibly clever and powerful one. Um, I think it's the first Kutzia book I read, and I've gone on to read many others of his and really loved his work. It, it, it's not an easy read at all, but I think it gets to the heart of so many conversations in a way that fiction really can um, and I, I discussed this once in a book club, thinking that everybody would be deeply upset by it. And actually, it led to some really fruitful conversations because of how provocative parts of this book are. So actually, as a winner, I think it entirely makes sense. Um, I'll talk about some other favourites on this list as I go. I still think this is the rightful winner. Um, and I think it's gone on to still have more of a life. But it is a deeply difficult book um, in that respect, subject matter wise. It's and and the the point of view of it is so complex, but I think is so worthwhile having as part of a discussion. Next up, we have Fasting Feasting by Anita Desai, and this is the book I mentioned earlier that the judges were somewhat split about. This is a book where two of the judges, and notably as well the women um, on this panel, chose this as their favourite and wanted this above disgrace, and it's interesting that this book a shortlist essentially divided by was divided by gender lines in that respect um because this book i think is such a beautiful way of portraying various story points and is almost directly oppositional to something like disgrace disgrace is so loud and focused uh, on this really difficult topic and is really grim and difficult to sit with. Fasting Feasting employs almost subtler techniques throughout of being this really beautiful story about a family drama and particularly the ways that various people in in a family are treated. Um, so we see two two children, there's um, uh, a son and a daughter in a family. The son is the kind of golden child who has everything heaped on him and is that there's a future decided for him in terms of going to university and the daughter is expected to be subservient and do everything that the family needs to ensure the success and i think anita desai in the the three books she's had um where she's been shortlisted for the booker just has this real subtlety and insight in her writing that's so beautiful um, she's so able to get to the heart of a character's motivations and their inner worlds and their thoughts in this really beautiful way and so this family epic or I say epic it's quite a short book but this family story spins out of all of those things where the resentments the the obliviousness um, of certain characters all play out in these microcosms and we watch all these little things happen these really intricate tiny moments between characters and between moments and so I think this book is a really quietly stunning piece of writing. Um, I read I read it first ages ago, and I remember being sort of being really interested in it, but not really taking in as much as I probably would have if I'd read it in my later years, later years at thirty five. Um, but you know what I mean. Reading it as a teenager and then reading it now, I think has different resonance. And it's interesting that this is the book that almost won um, in that sense because. Although Disgrace has gone on to have this other world and this other life, Anita Desai has never won and she's been shortlisted a few times, I think three times. And yeah, there's just this kind of quiet power to this book that's such a difference from some of the other books on this list. Next up, we have a book that again is also very, very different. Um, I think actually a really notable thing with this shortlist is it does feel like a shortlist from a set of judges who couldn't agree <laughs> because you've got books that are wildly different whereas you know 2024's shortlist we've seen a couple of books that fit within a similar mold of being these quite you know held and orbital um and uh, the safe keep as well that have this kind of quiet 
subtlety to them in a way that feels quite specific. And actually this list is all over the place and it, it makes sense when you come to read more of these because they are just so odd and different. But Headlong by Michael Frayn is the next one and I really loved this. I thought this was a really great piece of writing, a completely bombastic book in many ways. The core idea of this is that there is a, there is a husband and wife, they move into the country um, it's sort of a place they've been a bit before but they they move further into the country and they are there with a, a family well another husband and wife who live in this big country manor and as it appears have several pieces of quite valuable artwork and so the husband particularly the the first husband goes on this madcap plan to essentially defraud this man out of a lot of money while selling the painting. So he creates this elaborate set of um, calculations that essentially, well, if I get this amount of commission on this item and then I oversell it at this amount and report only this amount, but then I borrow money from here and I do these other things, then I turn a tidy profit. This man is not angry at me, whatever. But this book starts with a first opening prologue almost that essentially tells us this is all going to go wrong because we know that he's about to be tracked down and someone's very angry at him and we just don't know why yet. And this book evolves into this wonderfully absurd tale where our central character is obsessed with understanding the intricacies of this whilst spending all of their hard-earned savings. But he's also doing this completely convinced he's right, whilst his wife is this expert who actually probably should have been the one he asked all along. She is the one who is able to see through some of the flaws in this plan. And there's also this absurdity about academic language where she is interested in a certain form of iconography and he's something similar but very different. Um, and it's just that wild thing. I, I really enjoyed this. I thought this was a lot of fun completely balmy, balmy at some points, just wild and silly, and somehow works as a thriller about art history. And there are passages that are just the history of these pieces of art, which shouldn't work in a novel. It should feel dull and dry, but for me somehow felt really quick because it felt like it was told through the perspective of a particularly odious and deluded man. So yeah, a wild book, and I really enjoy this, and not a book I probably would have picked up otherwise. Next up, we have Andrew O'Hagan with Our Fathers. And I covered this in a weekly reads a bit ago. Um, essentially, it's the story, particularly of two men, a, a father and son, but really looking at the tendernesses and difficulties of male relationships, particularly male family relationships, um, and this stoic nature of not talking about emotions, not talking about feelings, but all of that within this much bigger landscape of Scotland and particularly Glasgow. And so, this is essentially two working class men really struggling to understand each other between their addictions and their stoicism and their lack of ability to talk about emotions. And so we watch as everything is changing around these men. There are these giant housing uh, developments um, that are being torn down in Glasgow to re be replaced with new builds. And the characters are sort of stuck in knowing that things are about to change but not being able to talk to each other about just how difficult some of these things are. I thought this was so beautiful. Um, I, I'm always really impressed when someone can write about the tendernesses of men in this way because I think so often you know we're, we're presented with male characters who are you know the tough guy and kind of impenetrable in some capacity and although the father starts that way. This book really looks at these subtleties of trying to understand the small things that have gone wrong in both their relationship and their relationships with others. I thought it was so beautiful. It's um, gorgeously done um, and yeah just a very a very heartfelt book um, in a way that isn't often well achieved I think. Um, it, it touches on so many traumatic and difficult moments in these men's lives and tries to draw out a path for how these two men might be able to come to understand each other. And without spoiling anything, I think the end passage of this book is just so beautifully done um, and so tender um, after what is a book that can be at times pretty difficult and, and hard. Next up, we have Adaf Suif with The Map of Love. 
And this is one of those things where I think this panel of judges made lots of proclamations that really muddied the water for a lot of things. The, the book of judges described this as being the most readable book on the list. And the way they say it makes it sound like, well, wow, this has to be the winner because they talk about it being this really beautiful, like the best read of the list. And then you realise that they just mean that this is a really good readable novel, but actually there's going to be a different winner. Um, and they even talk about it being, you know, sort of a, a, lots of other reviews talk about it being a holiday read or these kinds of things as well. It's a book that at the heart of it focuses on um, a few women, particularly two women in the more modern day, who are looking back over the, the family records of a woman who they are related to in some capacity. I don't want to spoil too much here. And it's set around Egypt particularly. So the first woman, um, Anna, I believe her name is, yes, um, is a British woman in Egypt in 1901. And so she's there during a very different time politically and historically but particularly where Britain's relationship with Egypt is much more one of empire and there's a, a sense that although Egypt is sort of being allowed to do its own thing, Britain is very heavily involved. And we fast forward to two women um, in the late 90s. This book, you know, this is the 1999 uh, shortlist. So the events of this book, of, of the, the later part of this book, are only a couple of years before... Um, it's released it's very much of the time you know there are things happening in this book in 1997 the book is then released in 99 I believe um, and so you just have these wild moments of realizing just how close to that moment she's writing and there's a lot that's particularly resonant with what's happening now she references particularly a lot of um, instability in the Middle East uh, particularly power plays going on by empires and how that's unsettled and destabilised various parts of the area. There's a lot in this about these women trying to understand each other whilst there's a, another line that exists between them of one, uh, bo both being related to this woman, but there being a, a sort of racial difference that happens here. And as a result, their comfort and ability to exist within Egypt more comfortably. And so this book really charts not only this other relationship that has led to where they are now of looking back over letters and so much of this book is in letter form where we look back at old letters or diary entries and the modern day where we are looking at the after effects of this and so this book in a very subtle way and also not so subtle at times is commenting on empire and these long-term effects through the microcosm of these three women that the the things that happened in 1901 and the things that are happening in 1997 are linked and we have to look at this wider historical context within this as well. So I thought this is a really beautifully done book, very epic in scope. I think it's the longest book on the list at about 500 pages. Um, this big scope of a book in terms of talking about Egypt and Britain and empire and various other things, but also just a very good read at the same time. Last but definitely not least, we have Colm Tobin with The Blackwater Lightship. And I've spoken about this elsewhere, I think. This probably is one of... I, I think this is about as close as you can get to a perfect novel, for me personally, for my own tastes. Um, it has everything in the sense of um, family drama, being Irish, um, it existing a lot around nature and the natural world and small town life, and also a, a subplot around... Um, queer characters and how they're accepted by their families. But I just think this is a gorgeous, gorgeous piece of writing. Um, the The central focus is that there is um, a woman, she finds out that her brother um, has, uh, has been suffering for a, a long time with uh, being not only HIV positive, but it having developed into AIDS. And he is essentially telling her or she's finding out essentially because he's towards the end of his life and what spins out of that is a conversation between Helen and Declan her brother to try to understand why these family secrets have been hidden um, why it is that he has gone away to be to be ill and to basically die without her knowing out of a sense of shame about being gay or about his HIV status and that family 
break that family relationship breakdown is also mirrored in another relationship with their own mother as well and so what spins out of this is really a, a story about what we tell family and what we don't tell them and why we don't tell them these beautiful bits of writing where characters try to understand each other um and we see the depths of these family difficulties there are characters who haven't spoken in years and we see partly why, but we also see the long-term effects that's had, that because of this, people feel this sense of uh, disagreement or frustration, or they've built up the other person as this giant boogeyman, and that's not really the case. They actually do deeply love each other. It's just complicated. Um, and I think this book just does this so beautifully. Colm Tobin's writing is often just so sensitive and beautiful in what he's able to capture. And... For me, just the, the scenes between family members in this book are just divine. I think this is so exquisitely done and rendered. It's so beautiful, um, whilst also being an utterly heartbreaking book. But we also get these little moments of them looking at the out to sea or looking at the landscape. And there's something, although this book doesn't have to be set in Ireland, there is something very Irish about so, mon so many of the qualities in this book. And I just think it's exquisite. I, 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 it, for me, this is, if it hadn't been Disgrace, this is the winner for me. I, I just think this is a, a brilliant, brilliant novel. So that takes us to the end of the shortlist. And I think, as you can tell, I really like this shortlist. I think this is an exceptionally strong shortlist. Um, there are, I think, three, four books that I quite comfortably gave five star ratings to. Um, obviously, it's not all about those ratings, but, you know, that's a big part of it. Clearly, the judges had the overall winner, Disgrace, had a winner that uh, that two of the judges would have gone for, Fasting Feasting, and had um, uh, the, uh, the Map of Love, which is this, you know, the most readable and the book that they would have recommended in that respect. It's a book, it's a, a list that in some ways doesn't make sense, but it does have some common overarching themes, particularly around gendered family relationships and what that does um, or, or how those things can look. Particularly this this idea of the, the echoes of history comes through in quite a few of these. So in Our Fathers, this idea of the, the echoes of what one, what one man... Uh, does really having an effect on the next man in the map of love about the the relations between these people alive or dead and i think as well as this the list is just so good at capturing these sensitive moments particularly of men um in a way that you don't often see as much and then you've got a book like headlong that is just bombastic <laughs> just is just there in a really great way as well it's a difficult one i think to choose a winner on i still think disgrace is a a fantastic winner. I would not object to any other book winning. I think it, the, the closest next one for me, as you may be able to predict, is The Blackwater Lightship, which I, I just think is perfect. I think this is incredible. Um, the easiest five stars to give in the world, and um, for me. And um, then kind of putting them all together, I think I just think this is a very strong shortlist. I think this is a shortlist that has so many exceptional pieces of writing that really interrogates so many parts of what it means to be human um, in, a, in a really beautiful way. Um, and so, yeah, any of these would be perfectly valid um, and brilliant winners, I think. But just a very, very tight shortlist. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts if you've read any of these. Um, I Particularly seeing a book like Disgrace be in the best of the Booker winners thing later on um, in the, the Booker's history where they, I think it was one of the ones shortlist to be, shortlisted to be part of the best of Booker 40 kind of thing. I just think this is brilliant. Um, but yeah, anyway, would love to hear your thoughts. Take care and speak to you all soon. Bye-bye.